All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Worthing, and I'm the Executive Director of the Yarmouth History Center, and we're very happy to have you here for our spring, our final spring lecture of the year. Um, just a couple things before I introduce our speaker. First off, we'd like to thank the Leon and Lisa Gorman Fund for their uh, generous support of our lecture series. We also rely on our members and donors to help us put on events and programs like this, so thank you to all of you who support us. To make sure we have the best sound quality for today's program, I'd ask that you stay on mute during the presentation. We will have time for questions during the talk. I think the plan is to pause after talking about deeds. So if you have deed specific questions, you can ask them then. We'll have another pause uh, when we talk about maps and then everything else can, can hold off until the end. If you are more comfortable putting something into the chat box, a question that way, please feel free to do that and I'll pose it to Margaret at the right time. Uh, for today's speaker, we're really pleased to welcome Margaret Gertner here. Uh, Margaret is a historic building consultant based in Portland. Since earning her degrees from the Parsons School of Design and the University of Pennsylvania, she spent the last 20 years working on a wide range of historic preservation projects. She works with building owners in all phases of preservation, from archival research to project planning and specification writing, and finally working in the field with contractors for successful implementation. Her work includes building condition assessments, project design, the occasional National Register nomination, and working to successfully apply for certified rehabilitations, also known as tax credits. She especially, especially enjoys working with historic sites where every project is an opportunity to consider and possibly strengthen a site's interpretation. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Katie, for the introduction. Hello, everybody, and thank you for taking the time out to join us and learn about researching in Yarmouth. Um, as Katie mentioned, I am a historic preservation consultant and I have worked in Philadelphia, New York, and all the way up into New England. And therefore I've researched everywhere from the mid-Atlantic up through New England and I'm familiar with deeds and archives in that region. Um, some of the buildings I've had a lot of fun researching include the oldest airport hangar in New Hampshire. Uh, that's in Claremont. Uh, I researched and wrote the history of the Sackford House in Portland for Greater Portland Landmarks. And I wrote the historic structure report for the Harriet Beecher Stowe House um, for Bowdoin College and that's in Brunswick. So those are some of the more interesting projects I've been able to work on. Um, and then recently last fall, I was actually in a really deep dive into the history of a historic building, but it turned out more to be about the mill that had been on that property. Um, and that was in North Stonington, Connecticut. And that turned out to be a really interesting one to do. But this talk is specifically going to be about researching in Yarmouth, Maine uh, and Cumberland County. So um, I'm gonna turn my computer, I'm gonna turn my camera off while I go through my slides because it's just hard for me to see everything at once. So um, we are going to look into researching a historic home in Yarmouth. All right, what's going on? And when we do that, there's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, four little things to keep in your mind and take a deep breath. <laughs> Number one, indexes are made by humans. Humans aren't perfect, indexes aren't perfect, except the fact that you will end up searching for things multiple times using multiple spellings, and eventually you will find it. The second uh, thought for the day is keywords. Keywords are lists that you keep, and they're the words that you will use when you're going through indexes, indexes looking for information. And the more you learn about the property, the more keywords you have, and the more things you have to look up, and the more information you find. And it just becomes, it just keeps expanding, expanding, and allowing you to find more and more and more about the building. Uh, place names, street names, and numbers can all be changed. So many streets will be renumbered, house numbers will be reassigned. This has happened in Yarmouth. Um, streets will be renamed. There definitely are many streets in Yarmouth that have had their names changed over the year. And even parts of towns can be renamed. So before 1849, Yarmouth was actually North Yarmouth. And parts of Yarmouth were called Yarmouthville. 
And it's important to, to note these things as you're researching because those are more keywords that you can then use to search and not miss something. And last but not least, puzzles are fun and just have fun with the process. For those of you that might be involved with genealogy, you're probably aware that your family history is never really finished. You're always finding another branch of the family, somebody else, a, a, a relative you never knew appears and has a whole set of documents you didn't know about and you're always adding to the story of your family history. And similarly, when you research a building, I think you'll find it's an ongoing process and it, it never really is finished, especially now with the internet and so much more information becoming available to us even in a remote location from where that item might be. And if it makes you feel any better, most of my reports end with a section, topics for further study. And it's items that came up in my research, but there just wasn't time, or maybe the item was too remote for me to get there before the deadline. And so I, I pretty much always have a list included of things that require further study. Uh, so uh, before we get too much further, I wanted to quickly talk about primary sources and secondary sources. So as a historian, we work with primary sources and secondary sources. And I think the easiest way to explain a primary source is it's firsthand information. It's the firsthand account. Um, a secondary source is one step removed. It's somebody else's presentation or record or telling of that initial event or item. So primary sources include deeds, maps, wills, letters. Those are all original items. Um, newspaper reports by people who witnessed an event, although I will say newspapers can have a lot of errors in them. Uh, speeches, diaries, letters, interviews. Um, those are all eyewitness accounts and primary sources. Survey data, census records, or um, census statistics, economic statistics, survey, information and then photographs and videos, audio re recordings, those are all primary sources. Secondary sources are pretty much anytime somebody else is presenting information. So most books are secondary sources. Um, a documentary is a secondary source, but it might include a lot of primary source material in it, but it's on in its totality, it's a secondary source. So for, for this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on primary sources. I, I mean, there certainly are lots of secondary sources and they can be helpful, but by going back to the primary sources, you're eliminating errors that might've happened when somebody else did the research and the, and the recording and the interpretation of, of the information. So uh, I just have a quick example here. Um, if you are in Yarmouth and you are in one of these properties in this list, there is a national register nomination form for your building. That's a really good secondary source. Um, there's also Karma. I noticed some names. I recognize some names. Uh, I see Bob Parkers, Barbara Parkers, and I saw Binks is here, and some of the other people who helped with our survey project. Uh, for Yarmouth, and there's a link here to Karma. That's where all of our survey forms live. And so most of the buildings in downtown Yarmouth were surveyed as part of that project. And there is a form available through Karma with some information and that's secondary source information. Um, find a grave, not building specific, but it's another example of a secondary source resource uh, if you're looking into the residents of your building. So. If you want to research a building, where do we start? Step one is the chain of title. A lot of people don't like to do a chain of title, but it is the first step and you need to do it. And it is actually interesting. I mean, some deeds can have a lot of really interesting information in them, but this is the first step. So the chain of title or the title search is that they might've called it when you bought your house is the list of the property owners. It's, it's the ownership history of the property. And we develop this using deeds and wills. So in Maine, there are basically two ways you can transfer a property, either by deed or by will. And so some people are now going to say, well, well, there's a, yeah, yes, there are other things. There's eminent domain, the government can seize a property. The bank could foreclose on a property if the mortgage wasn't paid and the town could seize it for back taxes. 
But even if any of those legal proceedings did happen, it will be recorded with a deed. So there, it's basically there's going to be a deed or a will that records the transfer of ownership. So when we create the chain of title, we start with the most recent deed and we work backwards. Um, and in Cumberland County, well, Yarmouth is in Cumberland County and Cumberland County's deeds are with the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, which is in Portland, Maine. And um, we are really lucky because this is really one of the best registry of deeds online services that I've worked with. The deeds are all there from day one, which in Cumberland County is 1753. So we have all of our deeds online back to 1753. It's a free service. Uh, I've noticed some counties and other states have started charging just to even look at a deed. Um, ours are still free. And the indexing is really well done. You know, there are some of the usual glitches, names can be misspelled. If you're looking for some, someone named Olson, you wanna look for O-L-S-O-N, O-L-S-E-N. Um, there's other weird things like the name William. Maybe they wrote William, maybe they wrote W-M and stopped. So, you know, it, it, it can be inconsistently indexed, but in my experience, it's, it is indexed. Um, I've worked in other registries of deeds and I can search for a name and only 10 deeds will appear, but the deeper I go, I find more deeds assigned to that name. I just can't figure out why on earth they didn't come up in a search. And I did spell it right, um, but this doesn't happen. I mean, ours are so well indexed. It's, it's really an impressive uh, registry of deeds that Cumberland County has put together. Uh, there are also some file plans and surveys so they have two collections here. We've got one collection of, of deeds and then a second collection of plans and surveys. So if you had a, a 10 acre parcel, you're gonna subdivide it into two acre parcels and sell them. You might get that surveyed and then file that with the registry of deeds as a record. Um, in Portland, a lot of times when they set up the streets, if they took a large parcel and then we're gonna set it up with gridded streets, they filed a plan of those streets with the registry of deeds. So those are some of the things that might be filed there. A survey may or may not, they don't have to be filed, but many of them are. So the second way we transfer property is wills. Um, wills are kept by the probate court and in Cumberland County, the registry of probate or probate court records are in Portland as well. Um, the bad news is there was a fire in 1908 and the all the probate records were at Portland City Hall. There was a devastating fire and the records were destroyed. So probate records, uh, wills, administrations from before 1908 are probably gone. Uh, that is the bad news. The good news is that a lot of people filed the will with the registry of deeds. Uh, so, the will may have burned up, but the family may have recorded it with the, with the registry of deeds anyway. So you have pretty good odds of finding it. What's disappointing is that probate court would keep records of an estate. So a person passes away and there's an executor who's then managing the disbursement of that estate. And he had to record, he or she, it's always a he, had to record every penny that was spent out of the estate. And those records are a gold mine because you learn so much about how they ran their household because this executor would continue to pay the gas bill. He'd pay the coal bill. He'd pay, I found them, he'd buy oranges. <laughs> and you would learn so much about the day-to-day -day of the household. Um, unfortunately, in Cumberland County, I think most of that has been lost before 1908 anyway. So um, how do we find... We're going to start in the beginning and find our deeds. How do you find your deed? Well, again, good news. You live in Yarmouth. We have an assessor's database online. Um, and you will very easily find your deed if you don't happen to have it on hand. So, oh, I should mention 
Katie sent out an email earlier with links in it. And so all the links that are in my talk have been emailed to you. And if you didn't get it, we'll resend it. And we'll also, um, we can PDF this presentation and email that to you as well. So don't feel that you need to screenshot or fur furiously take notes. We'll be emailing all this to you. Um, so in Yarmouth, um, the local assessor has a database online and you can find your deed reference using this. This is the home page for Yarmouth, Maine. Uh, enter the database. Um, you can search for your street. Again, here we go with the imperfect index. Notice that some of these people have street spelled out and some only have ST. So if you were searching for East Main Street spelled out, you might miss a few. So just, I often just don't put in street or avenue or any of that. I just put in East Main, Elm, because you just don't know when it's abbreviated and when it's not. And that happens everywhere, not just in Yarmouth. So just a funny little example of indexing not being perfect. And so you find your address and this window is something similar to this will appear. And you've got some information here. Um, you've got the address of the property, you've got the map and block reference, which has to do with the tax maps. You've got the owner, uh, the owner's address. Uh, the appraised value, but most importantly, what you have for our purposes is circled in red. It's the book and page reference. So this is the most recent deed associated with this property. So it's um, book 35,759, page 20, and they give you a sale date. And for this property, we've actually got several uh, deeds down below as well, because there's a more complete ownership history. So we note that book and page information, and then we can go back to the registry of deeds and look up your deed. And so this is the website for Cumberland County. Uh, we just select Cumberland County and hit go, and it's going to take you into a database where you can search for your deed. Uh, so this is what the database typically looks like. Uh, you'll see in the top, image, you can choose recorded land or recorded land plans. We want the recorded land, that's the deed. The plans refers to those surveys that I mentioned earlier. And then for our search type, we're going to do a volume search. And that's where you can put in that volume or book. Sometimes it's called volume or book, it's the same thing. And then the page number. Hit search and your deed's going to appear. Um, so that is uh, how we can find your most recent deed. And here's a fairly recent deed um, for a property in Yarmouth. And some of the things that will be included in a deed are um, the grantor, who's the seller, the grantee, which is the person buying the property. Um, when you're making your chain of title, I would also note the wife's name and for the reason that sometimes the husband will pass away, the wife might inherit it, and you might need to search for her name later. Uh, also, if the husband's name is John Smith or William Johnson, there might be literally thousands of deeds for those names, whereas the wife, if she has a more unusual name, you might be able to find the deed through her name rather than his name, and that could be helpful later. Um, it will give you the date of the sale of the property. So the deed itself has a date of when the property was sold. When you're in the index, the date is the date it was filed with the Registry of Deeds. Usually they're pretty close, especially today. Historically, there could be reasons that they don't line up very closely, such as if the property was sold within the family, they might've just had a deed that they kept on hand and didn't feel the need to record it. But then later when they go to sell it, suddenly they want a record of how they came to own it. And so it might get filed 10 years later, 20 years later, even though it actually, the sale actually happened 
1820, maybe they don't file until 1830 when they're ready to sell it out of the family. Similarly, if somebody inherited it, but they weren't gonna sell it, they might wait till they're ready to sell it to file it. So that's one reason the dates may line up. Um, it'll give you a property description. And this is really important. Um, I have this circled in red. There's a, a detailed description of the property. If it's a rural property and larger, it will be links and chains if it's a certain age. Uh, you know, to the southwest, to the south. And if it's more recent, it would probably be feet. Um, it can be a little bit confusing to read and I find it really helpful to actually take the time to draw it out on a piece of paper. It doesn't have to be exact. I don't need to know exactly how many degrees, but just a general, you know, draw a line going south, another one going southwest, and then sort of create the rough shape and note them dimensions because then as you go back in your deeds, it makes it easier to follow it and look for changes in the boundaries. Um, in this deed, it's kind of interesting because this is an urban deed and they specifically give you some information about the property because it says, um, a lot or parcel of land known as the Thoit's apothecary shop and lot. So this deed is already telling me something about the history of the property, which is that at one point in time, it was used by an apothecary. And it also gives me all of the neighbors, which is also something you want to note, um, who was adjacent to that property you're studying, because that can be helpful to you later as well. The other thing that's really important in this deed, you'll see it says a certain lot or parcel of land with the buildings thereon. So when this deed was written in 1985, there was a building in place. As you go back in time with your deeds, you wanna pay attention because at a certain point, it will just be a lot or parcel of land. And at that point, you have a window for when your building was built. So for many years, it will be just a piece of land, a piece of land, a piece of land. And then all of a sudden it's going to become a lot or parcel with the buildings thereon. And then you have the window for when your house was actually built. Um, so that's another thing to look for as you're working backwards. And then the last thing you want to look for is a reference to the prior sale. So you can see down here, use my cursor. It says, um, this being the premises conveyed to the grantors dated May 3rd and recorded in Cumberland County Registry of Deeds and book 6161, page 334. So you're going to take that reference, go back to the Registry of Deeds and enter this deed, that, that reference and get the next deed back. And you're just gonna keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that and going back in time. And that's going to give you a reverse chronology of everybody who owned your property. Now, if there is not a reference, then at that point, you have to do a name search. Um, you would take uh, the name of the, the person, you, the last person you know to own the property and search for them as the grantee. So I have a deed and it says, um, I, I, Margaret Gertner, I'm selling my house to Katie Worthing, um, but I didn't give a reference. So then you want to look to figure out how I, Margaret Gardner, got the property. So you're going to look for me as the grantee uh, in, the, in the index and find it that way. And that's another time when having the wife's name can be really helpful because if I, Margaret Gardner, was a real estate developer who had thousands of properties, hopefully, you know, the house I lived in, my wife was, or my husband or my whoever was also on the deed, and you can look for that name as well and narrow it down. Um, so that's, that's another reason why you want to keep listing all these names. So this is the start of the chain of title. And when I do a chain of title, I tend to record all those details. It's worth it to type up that property boundary once. It, it's tedious, but let's face it, you can then cut and paste it over and over and over again and just look for changes. But Typing it up once really gets it into your head and, and makes you notice all those little numbers and start seeing if any changes happen. Um, so this one is just an example. 
of a chain of title for a property in Bridgeton. Um, and again, you know, I, I've got the book, the page, the grantor, the grantee, the date, and then coming down to the end here, we've got meeting and intended to convey the same premises from Michelle Lynn Gallinari to Sandra E. Gallinari and then book 29904, page 23. And then so the next one down, here we go. Book 29094, page 23, that's that deed. And you just keep working back and working back and working back until you get back to, what you're probably looking for is when the building was built. And then that's going to be, again, the first time you find a deed that doesn't mention improvements or buildings. So um, do we wanna take a break and answer any questions about deeds? Sure, yeah, any questions from the audience? You can feel free to uh, pop it into the chat box or just um, raise your hand or uh, go ahead and, and ask. And deeds can actually be really fun. The last deed search I did was a building in Freeport. One deed mentioned they were transferring all of the cages for foxes. And sure enough, it turned out that it was a black fox farm. Apparently they were raising foxes for furs. Um, and I, found, I was able to confirm that through census records that he was in fact a fox farmer. <laughs> and when I talked to the Freeport Historical Society, they said, we have something here about Shaw's fox farm. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> so um, there was also something in there about the new, even though this man was selling the property, he reserved the right to use the south half of the barn for five years. So there can be really interesting, weird little bits of information about the property buried in the de deeds, depending upon the property and, and what it was used for and so on. So no questions. Okay. Um, so once you have your chain of title, you now have a list of names. Um, that are sort of like the tree and you can start building out and adding to that timeline of owners with additional information that you find using those names as, as something to search for among other things. As I move on, I typically like to have a timeline. So I just included this quick example of, of how you might organize your research. So the first column is a date. Uh, for when the event happened. And then there's just a quick bold faced summary of what that event was. And then below that, I might have some more notes or some actual transcription from the source about what I read, something interesting. And then the last column is where I found it. Because you really want to know where you found this because when you ever need to find it again, <laughs> you will want to have that written down. Um, some tools you might want to have with you. So if you are actually doing the research in person as opposed to online, you might want to have a digital camera. A lot of the libraries and repositories will allow you to photograph maps, photographs, uh, manuscripts. You might have to have a membership to do that, but typically that's allowed. Pencils, they do not want you to have pens. You need to bring your own pencils, a laptop, is great for note taking. Um, magnifying glass can be really helpful if you're looking at photographs and really squinting down and bringing a magnifying glass or a loop is really helpful. Um, so those are just some of, the, some of the things that might be helpful as you start taking your chain of title and expanding it. Um, I can take the dates from the chain of title and just paste it into this outline. But I do like to have the chain of title as its own separate document that I can go back to and, and have those actual notes transcribed in it. So one thing we're going to start looking at is, is maps and atlases. We have put, again, we put links where you can find all of these for yourself in your handout or in the email that we sent out and it will also be emailed to you. So no need to scribble all this down. Um, so some things you can learn from a map or an atlas is something about your house or something about your neighborhood. Some things you can look for the date on the map, when the map was published. Uh, a lot of these maps will show you the owner's name next to a building. Depending upon the detail, the level of detail, it may have a building footprint and you can compare the footprint 
of your building in one map to subsequent map to find additions and alterations. Again, depending upon the level of detail, there might be a building height or building materials. And last but not least, the neighboring buildings. Notice who the neighbors are. And when we looked at the deeds, the, the boundary description would list who the adjacent property owners are, and it can help you confirm on a map that you have the right building when you know who all the neighbors are. It can also help you later with your keyword searches to know who your neighbors are. For instance, I'm researching a building on Deering Street in Portland. I cannot find any photographs of the building. However, lucky for me, the next door neighbor was a very famous main Supreme Court judge. And so his house is photographed like crazy. And lots of people like to say it was the home of the Honorable Charles Foster and my building's in the background. <laughs> so any photographs I have found of this house have only been because a famous judge lived next door. Um, so again, that's another reason to look at the, the neighboring properties. Um, other things to look for are street names because they change. And so if it used to be known as Mill Street, you might find something indexed as Mill Street instead of the current street name. Old neighborhood names, um, you know, other uh, parts of, we mentioned that parts of Yarmouth were called Yarmouthville. Uh, I just found out recently that Oakland, Maine used to be West Waterville. And sure enough, if you search for West Waterville, you will find images. Um, and also then just, you know, changes, what buildings are on this map as opposed to what buildings are missing on an earlier map or a later map, you know, what changes are you seeing on, on the street? because that can also help you date photographs. So some of the, um, and the other thing that could be on a map is, a, is a, a directory. So the 1871 maps of Yarmouth include these business notices, and it's just a list of people who own businesses in Yarmouth in 1871. And those could be helpful to you as, as you're researching a building. The 19th century maps of Yarmouth that I have found so far on the, Left, we have uh, Chase's 1857 map of Yarmouth. You can zoom in on this and it's got a pretty good level of detail with names and owners. Uh, you can get this through the Library of Congress or digital name, uh, Kate emailed those links. And on the right is an 1871 map of Cumberland County that actually has two maps of Yarmouth in it. And again, they show building footprints and owners names. And these are um, available from digital main, they've got really nice copies and you can zoom in and get a lot of you know, really good clear detail on these versions. The, and then there's also a 1909 map of Yarmouth, which is available at the Yarmouth History Center. So between those three maps, 1857, 1871 and 1909, you can get a pretty good sense of the evolution of Yarmouth. Uh, here's just a quick list of some of the maps and, and where you might find them. Um, Library of Congress, Historic Map Works is a paid service. They have the Colby map of 1884, but it only has businesses, no residences. So it's not quite as useful if you're researching a house. Um, Osher Map Library is a good resource. Main Memory Net has a lot of early hand-drawn surveys and maps of Yarmouth. So if you're looking for a much older house, Main Memory Net could be useful. Um, for more recent information, USGS has historic top, topographic maps and aerial photographs on its website. You have to create a, an account, but it is free. And the aerial photographs, I think, go back to the 1930s. Um, so you know, if you're researching a farm or something more remote, it could be really useful to look through those. Um, and then there's the Sandbar maps. So Sandbar maps were fire insurance company maps. Um, maps in Yarmouth were made in 1903, 1911, 1944. When you start with the Sandborn maps, um, you the first thing you want to do is look at the key. So I've, I've copied a key here on the lower right image and all those little squiggles, numbers, dots all have meaning. And you're gonna, until you get used to what it, says and what it means, you're gonna to need to go back to that key um, and, and, and sort of decipher all those little clues on the map. So you can get these at 
main historical. You have to be there in person and download them, or you can get them online through the Library of Congress. The nice thing about the Library of Congress maps is that they're in color. Um, and the color Samoa maps are wonderful because a brick building is pink, a wood frame building is yellow, and a stone building is gray. And all that gets lost on a black and white version. So the color version is actually really nice to have. Um, the other thing a Samoa map might help you with is a construction date. So if your building is is not shown on a certain map, but then it suddenly appears on the next map and you've got a, a window of when the building might have been constructed. The other nice thing about the Sandwar maps is that they are at such a level of detail, you can trace changes in an actual building. So on the left, we have a 1903 Sandwar map and on the right, 1911. And you can see some of the changes. So you see the blue arrow points to a dwelling at the corner of what was then Park, today it's Mill Street and Main. And in 1903, it has a porch. That dotted line means it's a porch. By 1911, half of that porch is now enclosed. And they've put the number one on it to show you it's a one-story enclosed space. In 1903, it's marked D for dwelling. And by 1911, it's OFF for office. So there's these teeny little tick marks or little subtle changes that help you understand how the building changed over the course of eight years. Next door, we've got the building I've been sort of fascinated by, which is 305 Main. Um, 1903, it's dry goods, DG is dry goods. And by 1911, it's millinery. And then below it is, a building that has really changed over time. You can see it goes from office and crockery on the left to clothing, clothing, and dry goods with a large addition that sort of also swallowed up the shed behind it. Um, so these are just really fun to be able to look at side by side and look for all the changes. Over to the right, that large building here, that's a barn. It has an X through it like that, it's a barn. So that's a two-story barn. And then the other thing that's interesting is that the street numbers are here. So we've got 54 main, 60 main, 62, 64, but you know, obviously that's all been renumbered. But that could be helpful because if somebody didn't know Yarmouth had been renumbered, they might be calling this 60 Main Street in a historic photograph and you would miss it if you didn't know to keyword that old street number. So this is, again, the, the keyword idea. Yarmouth was Yarmouthville. That's from the Sanborn map again. And I got on eBay out of curiosity and searched for Yarmouthville. And sure enough, there are many postcards on eBay that show Yarmouthville, Maine. And a seller out of state is not going to know that we, we call it Yarmouth now. <laughs> so it's still going to be indexed as Yarmouthville or West Waterville or any Dan Danville, all sorts of place names that we just don't use anymore, things will still be indexed that way. So that's again why you want to pay attention and add those to your keyword searches. Um, do we have any questions about the maps? How can we have no questions? <laughs> Maybe okay. everyone's saving them for the end. All right. So uh, we've gone through the deeds and we've gone through the maps and these are you know, two ways to start piecing together the history. Um, obviously, I think what we all dream of are photographs. We, you know, we'd all love to find the old photographs of our house. So here's some resources where you can start searching. I think probably most of us know Maine Memory Net. Many of Yarmouth History Center's historic images are on the Maine Memory Net. Because it's maintained by locals, the keywords are actually pretty good. They will know that West Waterville is now Oakland. They will know that Yarmouthville should also be indexed as Yarmouth. <laughs> so the, the keyword searches there are a little bit easier on us. Um, the, the one collection that's kind of amazing is this Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Collection. This is maintained by the Penobscot Marine Museum in Searsport. And they have, um, there's a total of 50,000 images that were taken by this company. So the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company was founded in 1909. 
by R. Herman Cassens, and it was a postcard company out of Belfast, Maine. And they have glass plate negatives for Maine, or they, they prepared glass plate negatives to make postcards for Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, and Florida. Uh, Maine is very well covered, not surprising since they were Belfast. There are 50,000 images total and 30,000 of those are available online. So this, I mean, this collection is just absolutely incredible. Um, wonderful sharpness, wonderful clarity. It's just really an incredible collection. So definitely worth looking. I did look for Yarmouth and there, there are definitely images of Yarmouth in that collection. Um, Library of Congress has a lot of historic photographs. Um, eBay is incredible. <laughs> I have gotten more postcards on eBay. I will, a few eBay tips are, um, the keywords are really critical here. Again, eBay sellers do not know the history of Maine. I, you know, why would they? And so you really, you really need to get look, used to looking for different spellings. You know, is Maine M-E? Is it Maine? All, all the different ways you might spell it or misspell it. Um, you knowing historic names is really useful on eBay. The other thing with eBay is um. Most of the postcards, especially, they're not one of a kind. And so don't overspend, don't panic. I don't think my budget is five dollars. I won't spend more than five dollars on a historic postcard. <laughs> That's my budget. And also, you know, check the completed auctions. Odds are somebody else sold it or there's other copies out there. At least give you an idea what the, a, a price ought to be. And then finally, um, know the cancellation date if the postcard was mailed. So if you have a postcard that was mailed in 1914 you know that that photograph can't be newer than 1914. It could be much older, but it can't be any newer than 1914. Um, Flickr can actually be really good. People will share their family photographs. And again, the more names you have, then the more, the, the greater your chances of finding something that way, because people will typically index them, you know, here's Uncle Frank Worthing sitting on our porch. And if you didn't know that Frank Worthing lived in your house, you wouldn't find that photograph because they didn't put an address on it, they just put his name on it. So again, it's, it's the more keywords you have, the more weird ways you have to find information. Um, Facebook, there's a page called the Old Pictures of Forgotten Maine. That's really wonderful. And I'm not sure how to search it, but people share some really amazing images of historic Maine. Um, and, and all over the state. There was a really neat one of mainstream Van Buren the other day. It was really fun. Um, so these are all online sources. You can also find things through Ancestry. I'm trying to remember where I found a bunch of high school yearbooks have been scanned. I think that was through Ancestry. And that was sort of a neat way to find portraits of people. Um, and then you can also, there are also some collections that are only in-person sources. Um, so in writing and in, in putting this slide presentation together, I got to be a little bit fascinated by 305 Main Street. And this is the VIS card. Um, those who worked on the survey are familiar that Yarmouth did a survey of historic buildings in Yarmouth in 1972-73. And those photographs are now 50 years old. So they're actually quite a nice window into what Yarmouth looked like 50 years ago. So on the left is 305 Main Street then, and here it is now. Um, you know, windows have been replaced. The fenestration of the first floor has been completely rearranged. Um, just a lot of pretty heavy handed changes on that building. But even the VIS card helps it helps us understand a little bit what it used to look like. Um, Maine Historical Society, not all of their photographs are online. So they have a browse collection that's cataloged at the town or city level. So there would be a file of pictures of Yarmouth that you could go look at. They also have a postcard collection uh, that could be helpful. To, to look through. Um, city directories will help you find out who lived in your building at various points in time. Um, see, in Portland, we have reverse directories and those can actually help you figure out when a building was built. So the directory is 
a phone book before we had phone books and you can look up people. Within a directory, you may have a reverse directory, which is a street listing. And you can look up Main Street and figure out who lived in any given building along Main Street. And I don't know if we have those for Yarmouth. Do you know, Katie? Yeah, we have at least one that I can think of um, that goes street by street. So you can kind of look at the houses and neighbors and get a sense for the whole, the whole area. When you have, you know, if you're in an urban area, it's a really nice cheat sheet to figure out when a building was built. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, throat got dry. <coughs> <clears throat> so we'd, um, in an urban setting, you can use that as a cheat sheet because you can look back at the, <clears throat> the street listing and figure out if there was no 39 Main Street in 1900, but suddenly there is one in 1902, and then assuming they haven't renumbered, <laughs> you have a window on when the building was built. So it's just something that in other areas can be helpful. So the Yarmouth History Center has some city directories. If there are other ones out there, I'm not sure, but Minerva is a really good way to check. Um, Minerva is a statewide library catalog. And so when you get into Minerva, you, you find a title, but it will then give you a list of the various libraries in Maine who have it. So that can actually be really handy because it could be surprising to find out that <coughs> for whatever reason, a Yarmouth directory is in the Freeport Library, or you wouldn't necessarily expect it, but can help you find, you know, other editions, other years, and where they are. And of course, there's Ancestry, because Ancestry is constantly adding, and they've really added a lot of city directories um, to their collection. <clears throat> One thing I found with the ancestry directories is when you flip through a directory, you see the dates, but in on ancestry, I found that there might be three volumes of a directory presented as a single book. And I was missing the years as a result. So I, I thought, well, this is a directory for 19, you know, 1870. But somehow I accidentally figured out that no, actually there's three directories in this one thing and I had the wrong year. So just sort of be careful, find the title page, watch the page numbers as you flip through and make sure you really know what you're looking at. Cause it's, it's something that just gets really weird on electronic format that wouldn't happen in a paper format. It's just, it was just a weird little fluke I noticed. And so of course, ancestry.com is amazing. They just keep adding more and more and more um, at the moment, everybody in Maine has free access to Ancestry through um, the Maine State Library, I believe it is. And there's a link here, which Katie has emailed to. And we all know that they have census records, but there's just so much more there. I mean, there's city directories, there's probate records. Again, ours burned up, so I don't think they're going to turn up there, but I know I found some incredible probate records. Um, I love the passport applications <laughs> in the 19th century pre-photograph. Your passport had a physical description of your appearance, <laughs> which is just such a cool thing for people, you know, to know in 1870 what, what this man looked like because of his passport. Um, there's, there's just so much stuff on there. It, it's, and they just keep adding more and more and more. I mean, it's, it's just a rabbit hole, but it, it has really become very valuable. Um, Newspapers and tax records. So if you have specific dates, you know, maybe you want to look for an owner's obituary. Um, I'm trying to think of other dates. You, if you knew there was a fire and you wanted to look up a fire, you know, newspapers can be helpful. You know, thanks to the internet, more and more historic newspapers are being indexed. And that's also obviously very helpful. So there's newspapers.com is one subscription service. I actually have a subscription through Genealogy Bank. They have a historic newspaper collection that's also searchable. 
um, I, it, it's very hit or miss because they haven't scanned and indexed every newspaper in the country. Um, but you, you can find some really good things and it certainly could be worth a trial subscription for a week or whatever, once you have like a pile of keywords you wanna you know, blitz through. Um, I mean, I find, I, I'm actually kind of amazed at some things I found through that service. Um, Yarmouth History Center has some of the local publications that you can go through in person. Library of Congress has a lot of newspapers scanned and available online. Again, it's going to be hit or miss if they've done anything for your area or years that are relevant to you. And then Google started a news archive many years ago. and They abandoned the project, but the papers are still there. It's a little bit hard to use. They it may look like the paper you need is not there, but it could be that they scanned a hundred pages and just never got around to dividing it up. So it might look like they've only got one day. It may look as though, oh, they've only got the paper from March 1st. But look, the paper from March 1st is 300 pages long. Well, it's because nobody ever went and divided out March 2nd, March 3rd, March 4th. It's there. You just have to really dig to find it. Um, but you know, that could be helpful if you have a specific date or a specific event you were trying to, to research. And the one thing I didn't really talk about was tax records. We don't have, oh, I'm sorry, one, two more things on newspapers. Um, there's the snow index of Brunswick papers, which I think is at, at Bowdoin. So the Brunswick newspaper is actually indexed and that could be helpful for Yarmouth. It's not that far away. So if it was a fairly major event in Yarmouth, it might appear in the snow index. Also um, the Sun Journal and the two newspapers in Lewiston were the Evening Journal and the Daily Sun. They're now the Sun Journal and those have been indexed. They, the staff there did a card catalog that takes up a whole wall. <laughs> it's a little bit tough to get in to use it, but it is there begging if you ever are bought please don't please give it to the library please um but it is there so if again if it was a major event a big fire maybe it'd be covered in the in the lewiston papers um and then tax records i didn't really talk about we as far as katie and i know and we have asked various people we don't have very great well we have very minimal tax records for Yarmouth. We're not sure why. Do you know why? I don't know why. No, we have um, early church tax yeah. records. So we have a great collection of records from First Parish um, and from First Baptist that can tell about people's estates and how much they own. Um, but that's, that's sort of a 19th century source. And then there's the 1798 direct tax, which would cover all of Maine. So in 1798, to help cover the cost of, of the revolution and setting up the government, the, Fed, the federal government had a nationwide tax known as the 1798 direct tax. Depending upon what state you live in, it can be incredibly detailed. I know it exists for Maine. They have a copy at Maine Historical. I've never used it, um, but it is there in, in Pennsylvania, it was a gold mine, and in New York, it held burned up. <laughs> so it's all very much state by state what information they collected and, and how much you can get out of it. But in, in Philadelphia, they gave you every building footprint as part of this assessment. And that, I mean, that in itself is a gold mine. Um, but I'm not sure. I haven't worked with it in Maine because I don't really work with houses that are that old that often. So there's, there is, however, a 1798 direct tax uh, for Maine. And then the other thing to mention is um, we, we know that the census covers people, but there's also a manufacturing census and an agricultural census. And they were not done every 10 years with the population count, but they, they happen pretty frequently through the 19th century. So if you're researching a rural property, it can be worth it to go through the agricultural census and you will find out more about the property and what they were raising, how many acres of what crop they had, what kind of livestock they had. Um, and that would be an agricultural census. Similarly, there's a manufacturing census. And even if a person had a very small mill um, or only employed a few people, it, it would still be covered in the manufacturing census and could tell you more about the owners. 
Um, so do we have questions? Next round of questions? <laughs> Yeah, one popped up in the chat from Ted Jordan, who asks about the West Custigo Inn. Um, I wrote a story about the West Custigo Inn in our last newsletter. Um, and that's, uh, he's wondering if you've seen West Custigo on any maps in your searches. Um, was it your article I was reading? I think there's pictures on eBay. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures of the of the Postcards. of the inn, um, but yeah. just I think as a place name, if that's um, appeared on any of the older maps that you've looked at, I have not. not I, but I was, also wasn't paying attention to it. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. Yeah, um, I will certainly be paying attention now. Yeah, and that's one of the one of the names that can be spelled in many different ways, and so it's yeah. useful to kind of spell it A G O, spell it O G O at the end um, to really make sure you're getting a full sense of what's out there. Um, I will certainly be paying attention. I'm not not aware of that. Um, there's, I mean, there's the Grange, the Grange in Cumberland. That's what it's named. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of a used locally, North Yarmouth, Cumberland, Yarmouth, um, but uh, it's an interesting one. Okay. Other questions from folks? Feel free to dive in or put it in the chat box. There's a lot of material here to to digest. At a certain point, you just have to do it. <laughs> I mean, we can talk about it, but at a certain point, um, you just have to just start digging in. So, if people want to start on their chain of titles and see what happens, I'm you know happy to answer questions. If you you know want to dive in and start doing it, um, I'm you know absolutely happy to answer questions that might come up. And also, you know, the VIS cards did have some deep research notes on them. So when the VIS survey work was done in the 70s. Some of those houses did get title searches at that time. Um, but you know, it's always really helpful to go back and read that deed for yourself. I mean, just the book and page, it, it's a record, but there could be really interesting things buried in that deed it, and, and other, you know, the names of the neighbors, the size of the property, um, that they had fox cages <laughs> that, um, trying to think of some of those strange things that have turned up you know, in deeds. Oh, one, one was, you know, they'll refer to the house of our beloved father. And there's just reading it for yourself. You can learn quite a bit. Yeah. And as you're doing your work, if you, you know, have questions or need guidance too, you can always ask us at the History Center and we can help guide you through what collections that we have in our archives might be helpful for you in terms of finding photos or information about people or directories that might be helpful or maps. Um, we love this kind of work and uh, and search, so uh, definitely keep us in the loop too as you work. And certainly, if anybody's you know doing a careful chain of title, um, I'm sure Katie would love to have a copy of that to put in the file because the more this research we can start collecting and and keeping in one place for other people to use, then that's just a huge resource for the community. Especially as we start talking about national register nominations and district nominations, you know, the more of this research we can get done. Um, that puts us a huge step in the direction of, of completing some of these other goals. All right. Well, I think that's it for questions, unless anyone wants to pipe in before we wrap up. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming and listening to this. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, we will make a copy of this available to anybody who wants to have a copy. Yep, I'll send that out um, with the links we discussed, and then the video will be up on our website too. So thanks so much, Margaret, and uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye, Barb. <laughs>